Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a great day. Um, and we are here for our next session focused on the film Brooklyn. So today, um, I am so excited to have Dr. Brian uh, Dixon and Randy Laced um, back today to talk about our film. The flow of our conversation today um, will go like this. I am going to introduce the film, um, talking, uh, giving you a summary of the film. I will read our presenter bios and then we're gonna have two different conversations about the film the first one will be about the film itself right and an overview of the film and the second part of our conversation is going to focus on how does this inform our current uh present right our current um situations that we're seeing so that's going to be the structure of our our talk today so to begin, um, we are reviewing the film Brooklyn, and the film follows Eilish, a young Irish immigrant in 1950s Brooklyn. The film chronicles her experiences of moving to Brooklyn, developing life in her, a life in her new country, and choosing between living in two different countries. The film follows Eilish as she moves to the United States on her own, leaving behind the only family she knows. She encounters new customs, relationships, and homesickness. As she begins to settle into her new life and begins a, re a relationship with the character Tony, she um, is forced to travel back to Ireland after her sister passes away. Back in Ireland, there's a pull to stay by her family and friends. She obtains employment and even a potential new relationship with a man named Jim. Ir Eilish must decide whether to stay in Ireland or go back to her new home. She does uh, eventually decide to go back to the United States and reconnect with Tony. Um, so our presenters today are Dr. Ryan Dixon, an associate who is an associate professor of English at Goodwin University. He received his PhD from the University of Rhode Island, where he specialized in cultural studies. His academic writings include studies concerning 19th century American literature, detectives in film and fiction, ethnic humor in British sitcoms, and the James Bond films. Among the classes he teaches at Goodwin are English 303, Film and Literacy, Adaptation, a course that provides students with an introduction to film studies and invites them to think critically about what they see on screen. And Randy Lace is a professor of English at Goodwin University in the University of Bridgeport. He is the author of several books, including Cinema of Simulation, Hyperreal Hollywood in the Long 1990s, and The Twin Towers, in film, a cinematic history of the World Trade Center. He has edited collections of essays in the fields of popular culture, literary, literary criticism, and pedagogy. He lives in New Haven with his lovely wife, Anne, assorted children, and Sigmund the cat. Thank you both for being here today as we discuss the film, Brooklyn. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So as I had mentioned, the first part of our conversation, we're going to really start um, diving into the film and overviewing the film and some of the themes that came out um, of the film. And once we complete that, the second part of our conversation, we'll talk about how does this film inform our present, right? So right now we're going to travel back in time to 1950s Brooklyn. I believe the movie is set in 1951, 51, right? Um, and what we have is we open the film to a small a seaside town in Ireland where we meet Eilish, who um, is a young woman who has very few job opportunities in Ireland. She lives with her mother and her sister. And um, through a connection with her sister Rose and a priest named Father Flood, um, he is she is going to move to America to seek opportunities. And we really discussed that um, throughout our time this this series. So one of the things that we talked a lot about is, you know, community and this need for community and how that community even shaped how Eilish ended up in the United States. Um, yeah, well, this is very much uh, the core as, as we've talked about before, and as you kind of very eloquently set up in your introductory comments, the, the core of the movie about uh, Eilish kind of trapped between these two communities or traveling between these two communities uh, the community that she grew up with uh, in Ireland and this new community that she finds uh, a patchwork of uh, Irish uh, immigrants and other uh, immigrants from other places that she finds in Brooklyn uh, and the close-knit community that she winds up becoming a part of there. And then, uh, you know, as you said, the um, uh, drama of the movie is her uh, 
attempt to reconcile these two different communities and at the same time to like take advantage of the uh, opportunities that uh, these communities have provided her by allowing her to you know, make this voyage in the first place. Um, the voyage is uh, not really her own decision in the sense is more of like a community decision than it is her own. Um, especially in the beginning of the movie, she's uh, the character as we'll talk about later, is ex represented as being extremely passive and is extremely like, uh, you know, uh, just uh, amenable to whatever the authority figures around her, her mother, her boss, uh, the, of course, the priest, the neighborhood priest, and this and her sister, her older sister, whom she admires enormously. And all of these people kind of like make the decision for her, even kind of against her will, that it's in her best interest to go to this other place. And so right from the start, uh, the, her entire narrative is propelled by the interest that the people around her take in her and uh, the way that they kind of manipulate her, uh, her life, you know, for the reasons that are most more theirs than hers. But as the story goes on, you know, she winds up like taking more ownership of that. Um, and so then she works, winds up entering into this other community mm -hmm. um, which she finds in uh, in Brooklyn, and maybe maybe Brian can pick it up from there and talk a little bit about um, the community that she finds on that side of the Atlantic. Yeah, this is um, well said, Randy. That uh, the, you know, I, of course, I, first time I watched the film, I was taking notes throughout it, and and there reached a point about halfway through the film where I wrote down, "This is a film about immigrant communities." That's that's really what this is about. It's an individual story. But uh, it's about uh, the communities that help immigrants get settled and um, find their way in a new home. And uh, we're repeatedly shown Ailish on her own. If she were dropped in the middle of Brooklyn without any connections, you know, would be aimless and, and lost and never recover from her homesickness. Um, but there's a community there waiting for her that's been well established before she comes. And uh, one of the mo more interesting things to me about this film is a structural thing. Uh, uh, without, without hoping, without uh, hopefully uh, ruining the uh, the ending of the film, we'll get to that at some point. But the film structurally has this interesting framing device of the travel across the Atlantic on the ship that brings her to America, and it happens at the beginning of the film, and it happens at the end of the film. And so, what we see on these scenes set on the ship, which are very noteworthy scenes, um, is that this community exists even before she stepped foot. In America, there's a character, I believe her name is Georgina, uh, mm -hmm. another Irish immigrant who's there. And, and when uh, Ailish is sick on the ship and she doesn't know what to do, she's never made this sort of voyage before. She doesn't know what she's going to find when she gets there. Georgina sort of takes her under her wing and says, listen, here's how you're going to handle the bathroom on the ship that they're locking the door. <laughs> um, here's how you're going to handle your sickness. Don't eat anything the whole time we're on the trip. Oh, and then when they land at... Uh, uh, Ellis Island and they're going through immigration um, she says listen when you step up to the immigration official here's how you're going to carry yourself here's what you're going to say and uh, she offers her this guidance and, and she, Georgina is sort of that first representative of the immigrant community that's waiting for her that's waiting to give her a helping hand uh, mm -hmm. and help her get settled. You know, there, there were a couple of things that you said that stuck out to me in those scenes, right? It was not only how she prepped her to enter the country, right? She was saying, you're going to stand up straight. You're going to look at them in the eye. You're going to think like an American, right? She was very clear on you're going to think like an American. You're going to think like you're going to belong here, right? And then another line she said, which resonated with me being from, you know, the Polish, uh, Polish community, um, when Eilish asked Georgina, what is America like? She's like, imagine living somewhere not where no one knows your auntie or something to that effect, right? Like we're all sort of more disconnected, you know, in that sense versus where Eilish is coming from. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody is almost in everybody's business, right? In, in almost a very unhealthy way. And I think that's the points Randy was making about how this community said, you're going you're going to go. Her mother said that. Her sister said that. Her best friend said that. Um, everybody told her you're going. And she was hesitant at first. And sorry, Randy, it looked like you were going to add. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say, yeah, I mean, she's, I say more, she's more than hesitant. She's like terrified, you know, as of course anyone would be when they're told that they're going to leave everything they know and go off to some forbidding mythological place. Uh, and uh, the scene, uh, you know, that Brian was talking about, the first transatlantic voyage um, is to me, I thought very interesting in the way that it represents that voyage, not as some like, you know, you often hear like, oh, the, 
the immigrants are you know, gladly voyaging off into the new world and they're full of hope and dreams and whatever. Uh, but this voyage is like horrifying. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's like full of poop and puke and seasickness and nausea. All of the, and the, you know, the way, I mean, the, uh, the description in the book is even more uh, disturbing, um, representing, I think, probably a pretty historically accurate version of what it was like, actually like to yes. take one of these trips. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I thought that was interesting, not only because it sort of like supplements our historical understanding of what that aspect of the immigration experience was like, but also because of the way it worked, as Brian and I talked about when we talked about this film before, the way it works as a, as a metaphor for the wrenching, you know, uh, you know grueling, uh, painful separation that immigration entails uh, between this young girl and her entire life before her, and the panic and fear and you know, abject terror of what she has waiting for her in this unknown world of mystery and and threat, um, and that you know, so uh, you know, she undergoes that you know, kind of purging experience of like you know, pooping in a bucket and puking and you know, all over the place. Um, she's also kind of like living through that you know, the, the wrenching power of the thing. And then you know, when she gets to uh, to um, America. There's, as we were saying before, another community that kind of swoops in to kind of pick her up and help her, like, try to rehabilitate herself from this, you know, ruined state in which she arrives, the state of, like, homesickness and dislocation and deracination and, like, just, like, complete, like, you know, uprootedness. Um, it starts off, of course, again, with the friendly Irish uh, priest, Father Flood, who uh, comes in and, like, you know, sets her up with a job. And then it opens up to the community of boarders, uh, other uh, similarly uh, dislocated young women that she uh, gets to know. And, um, and then uh, really importantly, the communities of uh, social organizations, of like ethnic social organizations, the Irish club. Uh, and we, you know, it's hinted that there are other clubs, you know, in the community that cater to other uh, ethnicities. Um, and that's where she, you know, that's the so focal point of her entire social life is going to those communities, those Irish dances uh, mm -hmm. and meeting other Irish people and networking with them and, you know, doing like mating rituals and all the things that are associated with that, uh, with uh, that location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Lisa. No, no, please, Brian, go ahead. No, I was just going to pick up on a couple of things Randy said. Uh, one is this, this connection, what, very interesting to me in that first third of the film. Uh, is this connection established between seasickness and homesickness that this the sickness that Randy so eloquently and disgustingly described um, that happens on the transatlantic ship this 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 seasickness does not the sickness itself does not end when she gets to America it, it becomes transmuted into this this wrenching homesickness that that she doesn't know how she's going to get it over it affects her at her job it affects her at the boarding house I mean it's only the the community sort of drawing her her uh out of her fears um or expectations that that allays that and part of that is is these these scenes Randy's describing the the community dances and things like that and I think it's particularly interesting that we're shown the value of these immigrant communities not solely through Ailish, but for Tony, she, she, she comes to meet Tony, uh, an Italian immigrant. And uh, we talked briefly in our preliminary conversations of the significance of, of Tony, who, uh, you know, uh, he shows up at one of these Irish dances and a Ailish says, what, what are you doing here? You're an Italian. And he says, I like Irish girls, so I, I know where to find them, you know, and that's Tony. He knows the community is there. He knows the community is holding an event and that event, that event exists to make connections between people. And that's what he wants. He wants to make some connections. So he, he goes right to the social club. So um, both characters in parallel are show, sort of demonstrating the value of these social groups and immigrant communities. And I think you bring up an interesting point talking about Tony's character at this point too, because we have two different immigrant experiences. We have Eilish who just moved to New York, who is experienced when they meet, right? When we we're, specifically, if we talk about when they meet at the Irish dance, right? Um, Eilish is in the middle of homesickness, kind of starting to get over it, kind of starting to feel comfortable, but you could tell she's not really there yet. But you have Tony who is from an immigrant community, but he is the child of the immigrant, right? So he's born and raised in New York. So he becomes now part of her social capital, right? To tie in our talk from last week, who, or last time, 
who helps her sort of navigate life in the United States, in Manhattan, what that looks like. And as you see towards the end of the film, without giving it away, you know, you see his plans for the future that he now has as being that second generation immigrant, right? Who is networked, who has the community and he can now move from the uh, borough of Brooklyn into the now suburban development that is Long Island. Mm. So we kind of see these two immigrant stories playing together in their relationship. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. It's interesting too, just in relation to that, how, how Tony's plan is that his brother is going to do the carpentry and he's going to do the plumbing and who knows, maybe Ailish will do the bookkeeping and it's going to be like a community effort to like make this, you know, this relocation into the booming 1950s suburbs. Um, that that's like, a, that that's the that history. And it also occurs to me too, that this movie, you know, is like a, a, about immigration and it's a romance movie about like, you know, Eilish's two loves, uh, the uh, Tony on the American side and Jim on the Irish side. And Tony and Jim as like, you know, the immigration theme and the romance theme are very much like kind of mapped very closely onto one another where Tony and Jim represent two forms of like successfully achieving uh, a certain kind of life in uh, you know this country or that country, as mm -hmm. you just said, Lisa. Tony's uh, uh, is a personification of the successful mm -hmm. immigrate immigration experience, where Tony has really become you know he loves baseball, he's thoroughly integrated into American culture. He goes to Coney Island, he's going to move to Long Island. You know he's got like you know the entire like package of like American you know identity things. And so you know part of you know you can't help thinking that part of the attraction of Tony for uh, uh, for Eilish is that, you know, he does, you know, he represents like what she wants, you know, what the golden, you know, dream is for uh, an American immigrant. But then on the other side of the Atlantic, there's Jim, uh, who we meet at the end of the movie when she goes back to this. And Jim is successfully integrated into his community, even more successfully than Eilish was at the beginning of the movie, in the sense that, you know, he's got a, a house lined up for him, he's got a successful business, he's like, you know, everybody knows who he is, he's like, you know, so um, the men in the story, like, just like in, uh, as Brian and I were talking about before, the, the famous James Joyce story, Evelyn, mm -hmm. uh, which this movie seems to like maybe consciously allude to, um, the men in the female protagonist's life mm -hmm. stand for these aspects of uh, the wider question of immigration, um, mm -hmm. that, the, that who she falls in love with maybe ultimately winds up having more to do with what she wants for herself in terms of her where she wants to live and how she identifies herself than it does with the with the men themselves. Mm. That brings up a really interesting point. I'm gonna add uh Ken wrote in our chat, you know, and there's a constant on both sides of the ocean, the church, right? The church is on both sides and it's sort of dictating um certain norms and laws and customs at this particular time, right? Which is really fascinating. Um, and I want to bring up something that you talked about Randy that made me think about and we, we had talked about this in our conversations as well what's fascinating about what you described is that the men had the plans laid out mm. and she had the choice so especially if we think about women's right to choose you know right now we're talking about romantic relationships but that romantic relationship dictated what country she lived in to a certain point mm. and you know how, what were the options for women in the 1950s you know were or how much is decided based on who she decided to be with. That was the that was a big part of this particular film, but we don't see that. It's not that we don't see that in other films. If, I hope I made that sentence. Oh, I, mean, I, think, I, think, this, sorry, I think that this is uh, uh, one of the reasons that this film was so successful. And, and to be clear, uh, Brooklyn, this film was, was very well received. Um, it was critically acclaimed and nominated through for three Academy Awards, including Best Picture. And, and when we, we take a step back and look at the film, I, uh, it would be easy to simplify it and say, well, it's, it's sort of an, a romance story. Why, why was it so well received? And I, I think it's because it works so well in the way that Randy described, that it takes a romance plot, which is something that's easy to become engaged in, um, get sucked into the movie on that level. Uh, Lisa, just before we met, you were you and I were talking about the drama of the movie, especially at the end, uh, those moments where we're getting drawn into this sort of soap opera aspect of things. But at the same time, mapped onto this are some, some really poignant and relevant themes regarding immigration. And that romance story becomes sort of the perfect way of representing this 
immigrant conflict, the immigrant experience. So I think that's that's what's so successful ab about the film. Um, and to, to your point, Lisa, uh, it, it's a film about immigrant communities. And at the same time, I wrote in my notes that it's a, it's a film about the future, specifically Alish's future. Um, and they're, they're at every point in the film, every character has a different view of what Alish's future should be. Mm -hmm. um, for her, uh, as for so many immigrants in the stereotypical American immigrant experience, America equals the future. That's what her future is. It's been decided by her sister. It's been decided by Father Flood until she journeys back to Ireland and she finds everyone in her village back home has a different vision of what her future should be. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and your point about um, the role of women this time is interesting because Ailish is a very compelling, interesting character because we might think of her as passive, but really this is not so much a weakness like passivity as a strength that she's very sensitive. She's very introspective. She takes her time to think things through. And this is a strength for her, um, especially when there are so many people sort of vying for control of her life. Uh, Randy and I, in our preliminary conversations, talked about this pivotal moment when Tony says to Ailish, I love you. And she says nothing back, you know, uh, very that very awkward moment. And then when she, it's because she doesn't want to be pressured into just responding, she she has many thoughts on this and she wants to think it through. And so she meets up with him the next day or a couple of days later. And, and she says and he says, don't say it, don't say it. I know. And she says, listen, you're going to let me talk because you're going to like where this is going. I've had some time to think about it and I love you too, you know, but, but it's that introspection that is, that is her strength ultimately. Mm -hmm. and, and we see her doing that a lot throughout the film, right? We see her making very, I don't want to say very strategic decisions, right? Where she takes her time with things. And you also see this when she goes back to Ireland, right? And at first she tells Tony, and this is the part we talked about, Brian, I was definitely team one, I'm, I'm, I'm a Tony fan in this in this movie, I will say. I will put that out there. Um, yeah, how could you not be uh, a fan of Tony in this film? But, you know, when she's talking to Tony before she goes back to Ireland, she's like, no, I'm definitely coming back. There was no question in her mind she was going to return to him. Hmm. And then when she goes home, she sees a very different Ireland. And you see, and I don't remember if this was a sentence or just how the film is portrayed, you see her kind of thinking, why wasn't this Ireland my experience a year ago. Well, and it's interesting. I want to interject a, a comment here about uh, the the way in which the the movie is filmed. Um, and that's there's a lot of character development done through cinematography and color, which is very interesting. And this is something I observed when I watched the film and digging a little more. It's something the director has talked about extensively. Um, and if we look at the way color is used, it's very deliberate in the film. Uh, and the director sort of separates the film into three sections, which is one, the opening scenes in Ireland, two, America, when she first gets here, and three, when she returns to Ireland. And the early scenes in Ireland, they're very desaturated. They're very sort of gray and dull. Um, and uh, the one color that is emphasized through costuming and other choices is green um, for obvious reasons, I think. Um, when we get to America, Ailish's world starts getting pops of color all over the place, right? This is sort of the influence of American culture coming in, in fashion and in the places she visits. And then when she returns to Ireland at the, the last section of the film, Ireland looks very different, completely different than it did before. It's much brighter and uh, more saturated with color. And uh, this serves to sort of demonstrate this transformation in Ailish's character, how she thinks about the world around her, how her experiences have changed her, and sort of how her eyes are opening up to, uh, you know, the opportunities in America and equally the opportunities back home in Ireland. It's very interesting, and I think very effective uh, technique used in the film. And, you know, one of the things that we see throughout this film is this idea of a divided identity, right, which we've explored in different uh, sessions that we've had throughout this, this summer, right? So, you know, she never fully identifies as American in this particular film just yet, right? Um, and, but you could see there's that push and pull of where's home, 
All right, what does home look like? And I know we're gonna sort of end our conversation there. So I might be I might be getting ahead of myself to, with the speakers. Um, but what does home look like? Where is home, right? Who am I? Am I again not that this was necessarily said in the film, but is my obligation to my family? Right. You saw that push and pull when her sister passed away. She's like, I have to go home and check on my mother. My mother has nobody left, you know, and her mother actually says this to her. I have nobody. And that sort of guilt and um, those feelings make her go home as quickly as she does. Right. But then what is the responsibility to herself? right? She's starting to have this life in America, her world, you know, quickly changed in America where she had a job, she was going to school to be a bookkeeper, she was having these opportunities open up. And just because they showed up in Ireland at this particular time, where's her home? Where's, where's the divided identity? And I think we've had, no, no, interesting. I'm sorry, I think, I think what Brian said, it kind of like, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to like jump ahead, but it seems like, you know, the observation that Brian just made, it kind of like suggests that, you know, that home is like, it's not so much about whether she's here or there, it's about who she is and how her experiences have shaped her perception of the world. The sense that even if she, uh, even if the story wound up where she stayed in Ireland instead of going back to the United States, there's a sense, well, at least she stood up to to Mrs. Kelly in, the, in mm. one of the final scenes and achieved yeah. this like sense of like, you know, of like of, of independence that that, that that requires. I mean, I think in the context of like your original question, I mean, there's this uh, about, you know, about the role of women in 1950s and today and in general. Um, I mean, there's uh, clearly the sense, as we were saying before, that, you know, Ailish has to basically do what the grownups tell her, but also the, the, you know, the guilt that you're talking about, Lisa, there's specifically a guilt that is, that is, applies to women, that is like, you know, you know enforced onto women. Uh, there's the sense that uh, when, uh, when Ailish, if, if Ailish goes to the United States, then Rose is going to be responsible for living with her elderly mother, you know, her sister Rose. And then when Rose dies, now there's a sense, well, now it's Ailish's job because she's a daughter and that's a daughter's job. Uh, on the other, but even on the other side of the Atlantic, there's this scene uh, with one of the boarders in the bathroom. I forget the name of the boarder, but it's a scene that's in the movie, but not in the book. But the boarder says something like, you know, she says like, uh, oh, do you uh, want the bathroom? And the boarder like goes off and says, of course I want a bathroom. I want my own bathroom instead of to live with a, you know, with a bunch of women as a single woman. Uh, but then she goes on and she's like, yes, I'm going to have my own bathroom with a husband. And the husband is going to be sitting on the toilet and going to be this disgusting, horrible human being. And that's, you know, that's my future. That's the best future that I can hope for is mm -hmm. to be a, a woman who like finds a husband who's not totally intolerable and will buy her her own bathroom or something like that. And that's like, you know, and that's, you know, not too different from Ailish's situation either, where, you know, her, either of those futures are dependent on like, you know, making a tie with one of these guys. And of course the, you know, I think maybe this is more pronounced in the book than in the movie. There's this sense that she probably would not have gone back at all if Tony hadn't like, kind of like, roped her in by requiring that she get informally married or formally married without a ceremony mm. uh, the night before she goes back to Ireland as a sort of a way to like, you know, as an insurance policy or something like that. Mm. And, you know, for 1950s women, it says in the book, like the only person that she knows who was divorced is uh, Hollywood celebrities. You know, she's, there's no one who gets divorced. So that's not an option. Her hand is forced. And so even though there is kind of like this happy ending that she successfully accomplishes her immigrant voyage to the new world, uh, there's a sense that she, you know, kind of does it like sort of she's coerced uh, as a result of the fact that the only power that she has available to her is this kind of like sort of passive form of like being able to, you know, say no to people, but not really like, you know, um, but a limited ability to really like define her own terms of the future. Well, you bring up an interesting point, Randy, because as we were saying that, it made me think back to the film and the night before she goes back to America. The only reason her mom let her go is she admitted the marriage. Right. Yeah. Well, right. Sure. I mean, that's right. the that's the way you get through to an Irish mother. Right. Because the mother was very like, okay, you can stay here. You'll you'll marry Jim. You'll have everything here. And then when she finally breaks down and admits that she married Tony, the mother's disposition completely changes, and she's like, well, I guess you have to go back to your husband. All right. And I'm going to say goodbye to you right now. She doesn't see her off. She doesn't do any of that. So really is the relationship with Tony what brings her ultimately back to America in more ways than one, not just out of love and romance, but sort of out of guilt and or expectations of women in 1950s and during the 1950s. 
Yeah, and, and this is sort of a tangent, but Ken's point in the chat earlier was well made. I actually expected when I was watching this film, I anticipated the church would play a much more prominent role than it did in the end. In the end, the film sort of sidesteps this issue. I, I was certain, uh, especially with Ailish's mother, there was going to be a big problem that she did not get married in a church, um, because this is a major point. But uh, both that is, is sort of sidestepped and Father Flood disappears from the second half of the film. Um, and, and I find that a little surprising. But really, the family here, the family and the marriage are the stand in for those uh, those religious influences that are so very strong in Ireland. And, and, and to the one point about the church, you saw it a little bit more present in Ireland, especially when they were trying to get her to stay right at the wedding and stuff. And all the relatives or townspeople were like, oh, I see you hanging out with Jim, you know, oh, you're going to stay right in this back to this point of the community, right, where we didn't where we see this community sort of pushing her in one particular direction, which we saw a bit of that in the US, but it was maybe one person, right? It was maybe just Father Flood or anything. In Ireland, mm -hmm. you saw 10 or 20 people who were telling her what to do versus in America, she had a little bit more of that break to decide what she wanted to do. Well, yeah, and I think uh, Randy made an excellent point earlier in terms of uh, when we were talking about this idea of home, in terms of talking about character development and saying home really uh, is is a matter of, of character development, is a matter of Ailish uh, being confident in who she is and what her capabilities are and what her possibilities for a future are, whether that be possibilities in Ireland or possibilities in America. Uh, we talked about uh, there's a pivotal line in the middle of the, the film when she's sort of making the the decision to travel back to Ireland she says to to Tony you know I want I want to go back you know uh, my sister has died and my mother needs me and and I want to go back and and Tony understands and says sort of he understands he's going to lose her to Ireland and he says home is home and Ailish responds I'm not sure I have a home anymore um so this is this is the point in the film where she doesn't know she, she's between these two places and she doesn't feel that either represents a place that she would think of as home but this changes completely by the end of the film when we get back to that bookend um, where she's making the transatlantic journey once again and now she's in the Georgina role she's in the mentoring role for an immigrant making the passage for the very first time and there's a, a pivotal line there at the end uh, that sort of buttons everything up nicely for us at the end of the film where uh, the, the young woman on the, the boat says, uh, boy, I'm real nervous about going to America, but they say there's so many Irish people in America that it's like home, is that true? And Ailish just says, you know, very uh, sure of herself says, yes, it's just like home. Um, you know, and this is sort of her, she's made her decision or, or her hand has been forced and the decision has been made for her that America is to be her home, not, not Ireland. But I think that, that ambiguity is really interesting. I mean, what you just said about whether she makes the decision or whether she kind of is like, you know, forced to make the decision. And, you know, like the movie doesn't really like have it either way. It leaves it in sort of this suspended place where it's like uh, she doesn't really. Uh, and, uh, and to that extent, the movie, although it does, uh, as we talked about before, uh, make um, kind of make the ending a little tidier than the book's version of the narrative. In the book's version of the narrative, it doesn't bring her back to America. It ends uh, when she's still in Ireland. There's now the sense of like she comes home and there's you know this great sense of closure and she instructs a new immigrant about how to behave in America. Um, that all like kind of like makes it a little more like you know she's like you know coming home that she's like you know found her identity as a American immigrant. Uh, but in the book, it, it leaves it much more like uh, kind of up in the air. And I think in the movie, too, kind of captures some of that same ambiguity, that same sense of like the immigration, the immigrant story is never resolved. You know mm -hmm. that, you know, even a successful immigrant like Tony, uh, there's still a sense of longing and nostalgia and of like displacement and questions of identity and sense of dual consciousness and sense of like homelessness all of these uh, things that are so vivid in, especially in Ailish's early American journey, are never really, you know, they never go away. And I think that's one of the things that Colum Tolbeen in his novel wanted to try to like, you know, emphasize. And this, and the movie does, you know, in some kind of way, although it sort of like papers over it a little bit too, as we talked about, and we'll probably talk about again. 
Uh, but there's, you know, but I think that uh, that that you know, gut wrenching heart of like what it means to be wrenched out of one place and try to make a new home. And even if you're successful in the new home, you still have like you know, unresolved longing about the other home. That that's uh, you know, so elemental to the immigrant experience, and it's an important aspect of the immigrant experience that I say you know, conventional you know, happy ending immigrant narratives usually you know, avoid talking about. Mm -hmm. in the you know i think that's something about this movie too that it's it's a nostalgic not only for the 1950s but it's nostalgic for an idea of american immigration about what immigration is like what it's for who it's for you know how it operates um you know the sort of the, the golden sheen of like you know coming into the future and leaving the past behind and finding a new identity and finding love and finding a job and finding like you know economic opportunity and finding a suburb you know suburb in long island and becoming a real estate developer that all those things are like um you know so uh so rooted in a certain 20th century narrative about america the american uh, dream the american dream especially as it relates to to people coming over in the uh, early 20th century um but yeah. then you know but nowadays we look around uh, you know, border wall, rising ethno-nationalism, you know, discriminatory policies, uh, you know, uh, hate crimes, uh, violent rhetoric. Um, you know, I think this movie makes us like dream not only about the America's past, but about like our kind of like mythological past about like, is it, um, can we take this story seriously anymore? Is it yeah. something that still resonates? Yeah. Um, do we live in a world where immigrants you know, well, first of all, I'd say, do we, did we ever live in a world where immigrants had Ailish's like kind of like storybook experience, even though it's, you know, fraught and difficult, you know, in a lot of ways, especially compared to like immigrants, you know, from who are fleeing much more oppressive or dangerous circumstances than what we see in Brooklyn. Uh, you know, is there, um, you know, the, so the movie kind of like papers over that stuff. Uh, but, you know, is there um, a way that we can retain that, you know, what does that immigration mean, myth mean to us and how can we like, you know, use it to help us uh, achieve what I think immigration should be? In the United yeah, States. and this is a great way to head, uh, as uh, Lisa indicated at the beginning, we, we should start heading in this direction, which is uh, how does historical fiction such as this inform our approach to the present. But And, and you're right, uh, Randy, uh, it dominantly papers over uh, the the potential pitfalls or, or problems of this experience. But there are one or two noteworthy examples of the film acknowledging um, the problems. And, and one of these is the soup kitchen scene earlier in the film where we see what happens when a workforce uh, becomes superfluous, when the immigrants that were needed to uh, do these big construction projects in Brooklyn in the first half of the 20th century, um, that immigrant uh, population was needed as a workforce and they were brought in. And then when those projects are over, they become superfluous and they're discarded. Um, and uh, Ailish goes to, to work the soup kitchen on Christ Christmas for all these uh, homeless Irishmen who are out of work coming in and, and uh, uh, as Randy described in one of our preliminary conversations, uh, singing uh, these sort of hauntingly beautiful songs of Ireland that bring a, a tear to everyone's eye because they're stuck in America now and, and there's no work for them. So the, the film does have one or two moments where it acknowledges that, that this American dream, this, this perfect vision of what immigration could be, may not be uh, a reality and may not be all it's cracked up to be. Um, but certainly watching the film now, uh, we feel a conflict uh, between how immigration is viewed today in the 21st century and how immigration was viewed in the, the golden era, so-called, uh, erroneously called golden era of America in the 50s. Well, and a couple of things to what you just said, Brian, you know, there's one line that Eilish says in that scene. So she's helping on Christmas in, in the soup kitchen and she sees all these gentlemen. I, I did not see one woman in there. No, it's all men. Yeah. All men that come into the soup kitchen and they're, you know, and she's asking Father Flood what had happened to them. And he explains they had come over to build the bridges. And then when the work was done, they were, they didn't have any jobs. And her response to him was, well, why didn't they just go back to Ireland? Mm. And Father Flood says to who? so much had changed, right? So if they were in working 10, 20, 30 years, that's already being removed from a home country for so long that do they have any connections to go back? That's another thing about this dual relationship about immigration, right? What is, where, where is home? 
what are the connections and what does that mean to an individual? And I think we've had this theme throughout um, our series as this idea of being in the middle, right? And I think that soup kitchen scene really exemplifies that in terms of I'm not fully integrated in American life, but I can't go back to Ireland. As well. yeah, I, think, I mean, that's a, yeah, that's, thanks for bringing up that scene, Brian. It's great. I mean, the um, wonderful moment in the movie where that, you know, that shabby old dude gets up and starts singing in this angelic voice and all of these like, you know, all decrepit old like, you know, lumpen proletariat people are all listening quietly and respectfully and wistfully. The song brings back the mythology of a vanished past, you know, not just because it's Irish, but because it's in another language and, you know, who knows what they're singing about and it's haunting the alien melody or whatever. Um, there's, you know, this, that film, I think, poignantly exemplifies the distance between uh, the beautiful memories of home and the shabby realities of the present, and also just like the, the, the inaccessibility of those beautiful memories that, I mean, there's, you know, this kind of like haunting sense that we're all uh, exiled from some vanished past, that that's just an elemental nature of the human condition that the mm -hmm. immigrant experience, you know, just, you know, speaks to. That's a fascinating point, Randy, uh, because even, I'll say a couple things, you know, um, you know, as we look at, you know, immigration today, and as we look at where the world is, one of my questions actually would be, you know, is, is how we view immigration always been the same? Has anything really changed, right? Because we also, the, the, the film is very romantic in the sense of like, even her coming here, you know, it, it portrays a more integration to American life than is necessarily always you know, the case. Um, so have we really changed in how we view immigration, especially, you know, into the United States? Um, but also, is it this, um, I don't know the right way I want to say it, but, you know, in, in this, in the sense that you just said, where Eilish is listening to the song, and she's, you know, remembering home and how beautiful it is, right? And then she goes back, and she's thinking about staying and her last interaction is with Mrs. Kelly and the woman essentially is blackmailing her because she found out about the marriage to Tony, right? So again, small world. And Eilish has this moment of like, this is why I left. It's not a great place. This is a very negative place. This isn't a place I want to attribute to, right? But six months prior or seven months prior, she was wishing for home. So how much is it in the human condition of, you know, we think it's better somewhere else. You I don't can't go home again. You can't go home again. And what does home really look like? Is home what we create in our minds of it to be, or is is our really, uh, our lived experience, right? And this is where one of our conversations went was about an experience and versus reality, right? Or expectations versus reality, right? You know, and we kind of see this throughout. We we see this with the soup kitchen scene. We see this um, also in the dinner conversations with the women in the boarding house um, talking about American values. And they were um, very different than what Eilish, the conversations Eilish was having at home with her mother and her sister. I just want to interject that the scenes around the dinner table at Mrs. Keogh's boarding house are my favorite scenes in the entire film. I, I think uh, they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, Dame uh, Julie Walters is just fantastic in that particular role. And uh, uh, they're very entertaining, uh, not only in the way uh, in which they demonstrate character dynamics at work, but I think we talked briefly in other conversations about uh, the way in which they serve to demonstrate uh, American preoccupations, or if you will, American values that, you know, immediately Ailish is introduced in her first dinner conversation scene to Americans, we're talking about consumer goods, we're talking about films, we're talking about gossip. Um, this, this is what we're concerned with here in America, and it may not be used to, may not be the same as you, the, the conversations you had around the dinner table back in Ireland. So that's, that's a tangent, but those dinner table scenes are, are amazing. Or Mrs. Keo asking about if nylons are on sale this week at the store. Yes. <laughs> she was trying to get the insider information on, on discounts, right? Yeah. Um, and there's a scene that stood out to me with, I, I forget the women's names at this point, they're blanking. The two women that were, I think Miss Keo called them the giggler, the giggly girls, right? And that they're dangerous because they're giggly girls. Um, and the night where she meets Tony at the dance and they pull her into the ladies room and they kind of put some makeup on her, right? Really yeah. quickly, but especially lipstick. And one of the women says to her, well, at least you don't look like you're coming in from milking the cows. Mm -hmm. 
And that was a very, that was a scene, not only have I sort of experienced that in a Polish community here, right? This, this idea of, are you from the farm? Are you from the city? That's, that's a struggle there, right? Um, but also thinking about like the new roles and expectations she's moving into, right? She didn't wear makeup at home here. Oh, you have to wear makeup. You're about to go on a date, you know, all of those. How that's even changing her values, but her physical appearance. You know, I think as, uh, as Brian mentioned uh, last time we talked about it, I, this, in addition to the the, um, the color scheme of the movie, that the costume design also has a lot to do with like showing how Eilish's character is developing throughout the movie as she you know, becomes Americanized and wears brighter, sort of more you know, stylish, early 50s uh, styles. Um, she, uh, you know, her, her, the way that she presents herself uh, becomes maybe one of the one of the ways that we know, maybe even more you know, I was thinking before when we were talking, maybe like, you know, we actually know what she's, what is going on inside of Eilish better than she does. That we have like, you know, as sort of these spectators, as the film goers or whatever, we have, we can see how she dresses. We can even see how she sees in color. You know, we, there's these little kind of filmic clues that help us kind of figure out what she's thinking, even if she, the character actually winds up being uh, confused and uh, unconvinced either way and sort of on the fence, we can, we can see her Americanization, even though she personally feels like more divided. Maybe that's kind of like what it's like with immigrants too, is that they look one way from the outside and a different way from the inside. Mm. That uh, maybe on the outside, you know, you see a certain narrative of like uh, acculturation and socialization and, you know, integration, but then, you know, in the, the heart of the immigrant uh, remains ambivalent. And I think maybe that's like one way of reading like what we see in the movie. That is a fascinating point, Randy. I never thought of it that way, but that is a great point about sort of the socialization and even, you know, fashion would play a huge role in that, especially access to what clothes and what kind of clothes. And then, um, and we actually talked about this in our session with uh, Michelle, Michelle and Iselina about how fashion shaped how they presented themselves once they were, mm. when they arrived in the United States, right? So thinking about fashion and how that shapes our experiences, but also sort of gives insight to the values, right? And now that you said that, I, I think about different points of the film when she's packing for America, right? And she's packing to leave. And her sister Rose says, is this all you have? How did I not take better care of you? She only had like a, a couple dresses, one pair of shoes, and that was it. And um, I watched it with my husband who immigrated himself. And he's like, yeah, she only has one pair of shoes. Like he like, knew that she only had one pair. It was really interesting to watch this movie with him. Um, but then you see her changing in ter terms of more colorful wardrobe, right? More um, accessories even, right? There's Access a wonderful moment uh, in the film that really stood out to me uh, when she goes back to Ireland. She's doing the grocery shopping for her mother and she comes back from grocery shopping and she's got on this colorful dress and these fashionable sunglasses and the handbag and she looks like she stepped right out of an American magazine and it, it you know it's that image of her in Ireland with this fashion that says she has been Americanized in ways as Randy says she may not even realize herself and and we also know that any in any cultures uh fashion also gives insight to socioeconomic status right in terms of you know not only let's not even just talk brands or labels, but also talk about what types of materials, right? But also how you dress can be indi indicative of your industry, right? You know, what are you wearing? Why are you purchasing certain things, right? Versus others, you know? So that also sort of, I, I also see that scene as starting to show that her socioeconomic status is changing and perhaps growing faster than her mother's, if that makes sense. Yes. So we are coming coming really closely to the end, and I want to make sure if anybody wanted to ask any questions or you know participate or have any uh, other comments about the movie. But I want to sort of end our conversation on um, the topic that we are going to explore over the next year. Our next the topic of community conversations next year is going to focus on global citizenship um, on the individual and on the community level. So I really want to end our conversation thinking about how does this film frame our understanding of modern immigration? Immigration has always demanded that we do our part as a community. And I, I have uh, both Ryan and Brian and Randy to thank for that frame of that sentence. And I think it was really well said. Um, but how does this film frame our understanding of modern immigration, right? And, it, and not necessarily just in the US. 
I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, is what I, the important takeaway from this film, and and all great uh, historical fiction um, does this. All great historical fiction is sort of a lens through which we can uh, look at our current situation in a new way um, uh, by looking at how that situation might have played out historically, even if it's an imagined past. Randy talked about how this immigrant experience as depicted in this film, which is quite rosy in places, may not be genuine or real for so many immigrants who came to America. So it is a sort of, I'm not going to say the film uh, is a storybook film, but a storybook uh, vision of what uh, Americanization and uh, immigration might be like. And that is shown to us to be a result of the immigrant communities that were there to support Eilish from the moment she stepped onto the boat to cross the Atlantic. Um, and this sort of understanding that it takes a community, it takes friendship clubs, it takes social clubs, it takes connections made by family members to help an immigrant get settled and find a place in their new home um, is, is a mindset that has compl changed completely. Randy alluded earlier to the very ugly nature of the conversations around immigration today in the United States in Britain in particular, um, these are places that today are saying those immigrants are going to come over here, those refugees are going to come over here, and how are they going to get settled? How are, there's no place for them here. There's no way they're going to adapt. There's no way they're going to find a home here. Let's just stop them uh, before they even get here. Let's put up a wall or let's uh, stop these boats in the English Channel before they reach our shores. Um, and, and the answer is, as you posed, Lisa, that they're going to need help. Everyone needs help. You and I need help day by day to make things work, to, to, to have a place in this world. Um, and the conversation shouldn't be so much about what are they going to do uh, to fit in when they get here, or what are they going to do to make a home for themselves, but what can the community do? And this is why uh, in our preliminary conversations, we talked about the refugees from Ukraine, and this is why um, uh, a place like Poland is just such a shining example to the rest of the world. The way Poland has dealt with this refugee crisis from Ukraine is to open their borders and say, we recognize you're going to need help and we're here to offer that help. And there's a way forward. There is a future for you um, rather than just denying. Uh, we just, so much, as I said earlier, so much of this film is about the future. America is a future, you know, and current mm -hmm. conversations about immigration are uh, say to immigrants, no, there's no future. There's no future here for you. There's no future for you. Uh, away you go, you know, uh, and it, it's very problematic. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that's really well put, Brian. I think that's a great point. I think those, the people who say that, though, they're not just saying there's no future for you, you immigrants. They're saying there's no future for you, human race. They're saying there's no future for you, United States of America. They're right. saying, like, they're basically foreclosing the possibility of, mm -hmm. you know, a future where, the, you know, the planetary population can live together and understand one another and communicate productively in ways that actually allow the globe to continue existing. I mean, I think that's like, when I think about this movie and like what I get out of it, one of the things that I think about is that, you know, whether Eilish stays in America or, you know, or stays in Ireland and goes to America or whatever she does, uh, she's grown as a result of her experiences going to these different places and living in these different kinds of societies in all the different ways we've said, she's like, you know, um, regardless of the outcome, the experience of immigration, and even regardless of the fact that it's a miserable, horrifying, wretched experience for her, in spite of all that, it makes her grow. It like helps her like find herself. It like is something. And to me, that's, um, we said before about like the, the, the American, the myth of the American dream, the myth of American integration, you know, this, uh, this idea of like, going off to the place where the streets are paved with gold and achieving the American dream. And of course, yeah, it's a myth. Uh, it's kind of a myth in the movie. Uh, it's a myth in our hearts. But there's a power to myth mm -hmm. and like a meaning to myth. And that's kind of, I think, what movies in a way remind us about. The myths, even though they are factually inaccurate, are, you know, have like an emotional value to them and a political value to them. Mm -hmm. And I think narratives of, of immigration, even if they are, you know, sort of historically iffy or whatever, or you know, selective in the way that they portray the experience, remind us that diversity is our strength and it's our future. And it's the only future that the human race can possibly have. A future where different human beings from different parts of the planet are able to work without blowing each other up and killing one another. Uh, you know, if you believe that the human race, that the planet Earth has a future, you have to believe in immigration and you have to believe in multicultural integration. You have to believe in like, you know, the power of people to find new communities and to move around through the world and to be accepted and tolerated and loved 
wherever they wind up. I think that's, you know, I mean, a movie like this, and as it plays kind of a wider role in our, the way we think about immigration is really important because it reminds us that, uh, you know, that moving around and that, you know, entering new cultures and experiencing new ways of living and being open-minded about different kinds of like, you know, cultural communities and possibilities that that's, you know, what we need to have more of as a society. You know, that's the only antidote to ethno-nationalism and, uh, and perpetual war. Which is really interesting when you look at it. If you look at humans, right, since our beginning, we've always moved. Like we've always moved around. Like that's just been in our history, right? We've, uh, initially it was to search for food, but it meant we changed geographic location pretty consistently, right? And so- it's even a unique thing about human beings in, in, in contrast with other animals, you know, that they are, you know, that they migrate around the world so much and are so adaptable. Uh, you know, and so again, it means embracing our human identity as a species, you know, in addition to like, you know, allowing the future to exist. And Ken is adding, you know, race is such a critical element in the response to immigration. The racial other is not acceptable. And this seems to me the drive much of the international response to immigration. Absolutely. Ken is absolutely correct. Yeah. Although, of course, race being a like historical construct, you know, back in the time when this uh, movie was made, like Irish people were a different race, you know, like they're, they're when it's sex, exactly, like, you know, the idea of like, you know, Irish people or Italian people as racial others was pretty entrenched. And now it seems pretty weird, uh, you know, so like, of course, you know, it's important as you have that conversation, also realize that race is not even a thing. It's just sort of a social construct. Yeah, and the question we're left with at the at the end of all this is, uh, what does it mean to be an immigrant in a time of globalization? That if, if we're considering ourselves part of a global community and we're moving to a global globalization, then what is an immigrant or what is it to label someone an immigrant? Um, and Randy and I in our preliminary conversation had had a bit of a tangent about aren't, aren't we all immigrants in a way? Um, and isn't it helpful to think of this in the, this discussion in these terms? As John added, an insult of an Irish person is to be called a ginger because of the red hair, right? So even thinking about uh, terminology that we've used throughout, right, throughout history, um, you know, for many different groups and what the connotation means and why that was used, um, you know, if as a sociologist, my, my best summary of immigration is we've never really been nice to each other. Have we ever really been nice to each other? And Sad, but true. The, the more I study, the more simplified my answers become. They don't, or they're not complex anymore. They're just, wow, we were really never nice to each other. We just disliked a different group. With the exception of this lovely conversation and this series of community conversations where we've all I mean, been I, I love gracious this. and welcoming and tolerant. Well done, Randy. Well done. <laughs> uh, I know we're coming right up until 1.30, but I wanted to see if anybody wanted to add anything to our conversation or have any questions for our speakers um, before I give a few announcements. Um, so any questions or thoughts or comments? Why do I feel like John is unmuting as I'm finishing my sentence? No, I just wanted to say congratulations. This was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, and it just, it, it moves the conversation along from, you know, where, where I started the historical overview to what, where we're moving now, you know, the social capital and, and looking at the, the, the immigrant experience. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, uh, Lydia, Lydia or Lydia, did I say that correctly? It's Ligia. Ligia, sorry, thank you. Well, my apologies. Um, added, if heritage tests were a must, people would see that we're all from everywhere. Of course, yeah. yes, yes. We're all from everywhere. And, you know, I'm sometimes even curious to take one myself because, you know, my family's from Poland, but 150 years ago, there was no Poland. So where am I really from? You know, my great grandparents, I can't trace past my great grandparents so what what does that look like what does our world look like how does that shape how we view ourselves and our identities so thank you for sharing so thank you all for coming um i do i will say that this will be our last session i know last time i had announced that there was going to be one more this summer but unfortunately our speaker had to reschedule just due to technical issues we will get him back um 
at some point during the academic year. So for the summer, this is going to be our last official session of this community conversation series. And we are going to start back up in September. Um, September 16th at 1230 will be our first session. And if you are on the email list, we will send um, updates as soon as these things are finalized. Um, we, our conversation over the next year will be on the topic of global citizenship, but we are going to continue to explore topics such as this one on advocacy, um, immigration, community engagement, community involvement. So the th themes will stay very similar, but we're going to sort of expand our conversations about them. So we do intend on having three um, starting in the fall semester. We're just gonna take a little bit of a summer break starting now. Um, and we will come back with a program of speakers and continue where we have left off today on our conversation. If you have any questions between now and then, please do not hesitate. I will drop my email here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the series, um, but we will be sending updates throughout August once we finalize things like the links and, and, and items of that nature. So I thank you for your participation. Thank you for staying with us throughout the time. And I look forward to seeing you all in September. Enjoy the rest of your summer break. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to everybody else who attended. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Randy. I look forward to our next one. We will have another one. Randy awesome. and I will return. Yes. Looking forward to it. All right. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a good one.